Jim, if he wanted to play the song and he didn't know it, I, maybe I misguided it. At least in my childhood, the song about Zacchaeus was something we learned early on. Just kind of not if you go, yeah, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. It's a really catchy little ditty, Jim. I'm sorry you missed it. I was going to have to play that to start out. But it's a good thing I did because they'd be like, what is she doing? But, um, that was so foundational. And trust me, maybe it's a Methodist thing. But anyone who in the Methodist circle spent any amount of time, even a brief one, in Sunday school or at vacation Bible school, we knew this song. And even after years removed, we still know this song. It's as familiar to us as our own name. We know this because in many ways, the story of Zacchaeus, it is our story. And I'm not ta talking about our stature of height or our lack thereof. I'm talking about our stories. Of course, this story is found in Luke's Gospel, not only in Luke's Gospel, because Luke, the physician, his entire Gospel, and personally it's my favorite, because it's filled with these great stories. And Zacchaeus is one of these stories, the story of the journey of our lives of faith. Basically, the story of Zacchaeus is an account of a person's journey of encountering the Christ, responding to the invitation, and then claiming and living into repentance. No pun intended. But if we're being honest, we all fall short in our discipleship. And I dare say we also, we all can be very taxing to others. <laughs> and to go farther, I'm sure there are many who have said to us, why don't you go climb a tree? <laughs> Truth be told, probably not many of us have ever been called a saint. Yet, I wonder why not. After all, let's ask ourselves, what is a saint? We tend to stick the label of saint on persons who are seemingly perfect. On people who have never uttered so much as a gosh darn it in all their lives. Who always seem to be so put together. Always charitable. Always kind. And who appear to be perpetually backlit with peace, joy, love, and understanding. Now, I am comfortably, I say, in the man stage of life. And in my decades of living, I have never really encountered anyone like that. And to be quite honest, if I ever did, I don't know if I'd really want to spend a whole lot of time with a person like that. I got a feeling that wouldn't be a whole lot of fun. I got a feeling that I would always feel inferior around them. I would be uncomfortable and unsteady of my own self. And honestly, I don't think when we toss around the term saint that the saints we remember and have encountered and know, I don't think they do those type of things either. I think the saints in our lives brought out the very best of who we are, made us feel at home in our own skin and fully ourselves in Clint Eastwood fashion, fully ourselves, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Just like school days where it used to be said that we went to learn the three R's, reading, reading, writing, and arithmetic, today on this All Saints Sunday I present the three R's of sainthood, real, resilient, and relatable. When I reflect on the saints that I've been blessed to know and to be known by, to love and be loved by, they were very, very real people. They burnt the Sunday roast. <laughs> They grew impatient with their teenage sons and daughters. By mistake, they bought, and this is true, by mistake, they bought their grandsons actual blow dart guns for Christmas. <laughs> true story. Because nothing says Christmas like small children blowing darts into inflated balloons on the Christmas holiday. <laughs> they cussed very creatively and frequently when doing car repairs. I wouldn't know sure if I would have used the F word in that way, but good job, man. <laughs> they used spit on a Kleenex to wipe the grime off their children's faces. Their angst and yelling during any Steelers game cleared the room. They were seen most often and most comfortably in old faded blue jeans and big sweatshirts. And in all things and in all times and in all places for us, they were very, very real. We took them as they were, and they welcomed us as we are. 
and that wellness was for us a security, and it became an anchor for us in our lives. We each have our individual stories to tell, and also our corporate stories of our communities where we belong and that we bless and bear and build. And I dare say that not one of our individual stories nor our collective stories has always had an arc that's always on the rise. Always sunshine and good, it's so good we never stumble. We all have had our failures and our flights, our struggles and our successes. The moments of, I used to be, and now I am moments. I have to say that the saints in our lives, they got what the people I work with call, they got bounce. No matter what befalls them, they're managed to bounce back. I think one of the very best qualities anyone can have is resiliency. Tell me what you've been through, and tell me how you bounce back and how here you are. And oh, our saints were resilient. The saints I know have been through something, and let's be honest, all of us at any moment of our lives were either at the start of something, we're in the middle of something, or we're getting out of something. The saints I know had been through a lot of something and made that journey and helped us to realize that if they did it and were honest about it, then so could I. The saints I know were resilient. And as this holiday season now kicks off, Let's be honest, let's November roll around and the weather joined us a little brisk. <laughs> we now start thinking of that holiday season, that rush. And let's be honest, in a couple of weeks, it will be Thanksgiving. And I have to tell a story of, I had mentioned earlier of my mother. She was the youngest of 12. And she had five children, of which I'm the youngest. And it was kind of like my older siblings are all within two and three years and then seven years. And hey, you're not done yet because here I am. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom was widowed in her 50s and still managed, never remarried, and still managed then to keep this brood of children and then added on grandchildren. One of the things that was amazing to us, in a way that's almost metaphorical, was the Thanksgiving dinner, right? I mean, I'm in a generation where my mom would get up at probably 5 in the morning to prepare a Thanksgiving dinner for about 14 people. And, we, and now as a family, since my mom's passing, we continue it because it's what you do. It literally takes about nine of us to get together and do what my mother managed to pull off herself. And we got to thinking, that's unbelievable. It takes nine of us to do this, and it's not that good. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother did it brilliantly well. Martha Stewart well herself. Talk about resilience, and then you ask, well, why did she do it? Because she loved us because she loved us. And my mother and my grandmother and all my aunts, one of the ways they showed love was through food. They loved me very well. <laughs> <laughs> so when we think of saints and we celebrate that sense of realness and resiliency, too often I think we too quickly put our saints on pedestals or we shield them in stained glass. And what that does is it puts a distance between the saints and makes them somehow unattainable. My experience with the saints in my life, however, is how unbelievably relatable they were to me. They didn't pretend to be anyone or anything other than who they were. At their very best, at their and at their very worst. They never looked down on me. They sought to understand the lens through which I was seeing my own experience. When I'm in the middle of something, the saints I know invite me over to have an adult beverage on their deck. <laughs> or they invite me over and say, so why don't you come over, I made a pie, let's have a cup of coffee and let's just talk. There's no judgment. There's no false piety. There's no tis tis tisking or unsolicited advice. There is only listening and provision of safe space for me to be able to tell my story. And in their listening, they help me to process through it. It was like the saints I've known relate to me so much they had some sense of when to invite me over for dinner. Not pressure, just presence. And what a gift that is. You don't need to say anything that's going to be like, well, it's a great line, pardon me while I write it down. <laughs> we don't remember that. We remember how they related to us. How they sat next to us and just allowed us to work through it. Sat with us in what was never an uncomfortable silence. It was just the power of another's presence. The gift they shared listened me into the fullness of who I am. I was 
was speaking um, yesterday at a United Methodist Women's meeting, a gathering there, fall Thanksgiving gathering, up in Sarver, which is near my hometown of Freeport. And we were talking about gratitude. And I remember reading something when I was like in high school. And then it was from the Christian writer Max Lucado. And he made the comment that he, and he had this metaphor, and I really like it, so go with me on this a little bit. And think about as well as the day goes on, we reflect on the saints in our lives. He said that he believes in heaven we each got a room. And in that room are all the tangible objects that were key moments in our lives of faith, our journey. Kind of cool. Um, whether it happens or not, I don't know, but it's a fun metaphor to play with, right? So in my room in heaven, I can tell you that people who have journeyed me into my faith and I help me as I stand before you as having been ordained 27 years, there is Sarah Walton Baugh's telephone. Sarah Walton Baugh was a lovely older member of my home church. And every youth Sunday, and you know how those are, stand up there and you're nervous. Join me in the call of worship. <laughs> <laughs> and you can hardly even hear. But every Sunday after youth Sunday, I knew the phone would ring at my home. And it would be Sarah Walton. I just want to tell you how lovely you were today. And what a great job you did. Thank you for the affirmation, Sarah. In my room is Jan Porter's checkbook. Jan Porter was the organist at my home church. And when I announced that I was going to seminary, it was Jan Porter who every Sunday when she would come out and she would see me, she'd shake my hand, give me a hug and a kiss on the cheek, and slip a $5 bill. No flash, just stick it. In my little room in heaven is a yellow Buick. A yellow Buick, when I was nearing the end of seminary, I was about to go into my senior year of seminary. We went on, uh, the church I was a student assistant pastor at, we would do an annual youth mission trip to um, Appalachia, West Virginia. This was serious Appalachia, West Virginia. And we would go and we'd spend a week doing repairs on people's homes and then Part of that week, there was always a local congregation, actually many of them, that would put on quite a feast and would welcome um, us as the mission workers there to their church to celebrate with them, have a great dinner. It's actually very cool. And one day, where there, there, our senior high mission trip, there'd be about 40 of us between senior high adults, senior high youth, and, and adults. And we would go to this, and I remember one time going, and, and I confess that mission trip, I was struck. Because I was going to enter my senior year of seminary, and I was having a bit of a crisis of faith. Like, oh my goodness, in a year, I'm like doing this stuff. I'm going to be like Reverend Snyder, really? Because I always looked at myself as the least likely person to be ordained. And I was really having a crisis of faith, and I was kind of tagged with this saying, is this the right thing to make? Because it's showtime in less than a year. And I was kind of keeping it with, inside me, and my good friend... Cynthia went with me on that mission trip, and afterwards she says, come on, let's take a walk. There's a great old graveyard at the top of the hill. Oh, good. <laughs> when I'm struggling, let's go walk through a graveyard. So we went and walked through this graveyard, and I was like, okay. And when we got back down, all the vans that took us to this church, which was about 40 minutes away, they all left. So Cynthia and I are standing there like, Cynthia, how are we getting home? Because it's through the hollers of West Virginia, and we don't have a and they all left us. And I thought, now let's think symbolically. That's probably not a good sign. <laughs> I'm struggling with, am I really going to do this? And everybody in my little church world in West Virginia left me standing at the church. So I'm thinking, oh, this is a sign. I'm going to go back to teach English. I'm going to coach girls softball. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and a woman was still at the church, and she had a yellow view. And she said, you going back to the co-op? We said, yeah, come on, I live out that way, I'll give you a ride. So we got in her viewing, and Cynthia sat up front, and I sulked in the back, thinking, this is really bad. <laughs> and we started driving, and I was very quiet, and Cynthia was keeping the conversation going. And at one point, the woman turned around and said, so are you the leader of this group? And I says, well, I am their youth pastor, so yeah, I guess I am. She says, you spoke tonight, right? And I said, yeah. She said, you have one of those Pittsburgh brogues, don't you? <laughs> Pittsburgh brogue, I love that. And I said, yeah, I do. Thank you. <laughs> and she paused and she said, you know, I don't know why I'm saying this. I have no idea why I'm saying this. But I just want to tell you that if you've never thought about going into the ordained ministry, you really should. Because I think you'd be a good one. That 
Buicks in my little room in heaven. And think about all those times, right, when your realness, your resiliency, and your relatability have meant something to someone, to people you would never even know. That's what being a saint is all about. Those that know you well and are blessed by that, and those you encounter that just by a word, a touch, a moment, a gift, you impact their lives, such as the wonder of sharing and being neighbors on this earth we inhabit. Through the lens of real, resilient, and relatable, take a moment today to reflect on the saints you have known. They are known to you because they journeyed beside you. It was you who they knew and loved. It was your story that intersected with theirs. With theirs. It was you they loved and you who loved them backwards and forwards and all the ways and places in between. For all these saints, we have been blessed. For all these saints remain in our memories, and they are alive as we continue to do the good works that they taught us how to do. And I think that's really a key point. When we tell the stories and we remember, that's important, but really there's a vacuum, right? When someone you love passes on, there's a distinct vacuum. There's not that, there's an empty place at the table. There are distinct losses. And I always think that how we fill that gap is we live and do what they taught us and showed us how to live and do. So fill the gap with doing what they taught you and showed you and journeyed you. I think we'd all agree that we are living in some very scary times, very unsettling times. And I don't know about you, but I think the world could use a whole lot more saints. And I'm looking at them. And I'm looking at them. Be real. Be resilient and celebrate your resiliency. And in all things, be relatable to those you know and love and call by name and those you maybe sit in a community meeting with or work with or pass on the subway. Be a saint. Be a light. Be a journey mate. Amen and amen.